to Love Us Live. I'm Robert Martin, Director of the City Bible Forum in Melbourne, and I'm your host for the show. Logos is Greek for word or message, and Logos Live seeks to engage the Christian message before a live audience in the CBD of Melbourne. And do we have a, a live audience here today? Are they alive? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of people out there alive. And we also aim to have a little bit of fun. Who said exploring the big questions of life shouldn't be enjoyable? Myth or truth? In our current series, we're considering some of the big claims about the Christian message. And to help us, we have a number of experts join us. And today's topic is one of the big ones, suffering. Can God really be there amidst the pain? Well, our guest today is someone who has thought about this topic extensively, John Hudson. John is the lead pastor of Melbourne Evangelical Church. He grew up in Melbourne, studied mathematics and computer science at RMIT, and he also has a theology degree where part of his honours thesis explored the problem of evil. He joins us now. Please welcome our evil expert, John Hudson. Thank you. It's great that you can join us here today, John. How do you feel about being addressed as the evil expert? I think I'd probably prefer the expert on the solution of evil. Uh, evil expert kind of makes me sound a bit like an evil genius, but without the genius part. Perhaps, uh, like a James Bond kind of style, perhaps. The, perhaps. The evil expert. Anyway, well, John, today you're the pastor of Melbourne, or the lead pastor of Melbourne Evangelical Church, but it would be fair to say that when you were growing up in high school, if someone were to ask you, what are you going to do when you grow up? Being the pastor of a church was probably not high on the list at all or not mm. on the list even at all? No, not on the list at all. Uh, so I went to Melbourne High and during that time I uh, fell into a fairly bad crowd, got into drugs and drug dealing at one point. Uh, after that I went to university and uh, I was really struck by uh, the Christians that I met there uh, through the Christian Union and so I kept coming along. They, they seemed much more other person centred than other people that I knew and had spoken to. These people seemed different. What sort of things did they do that made you see them as being different? Yeah, they, they seemed to do things that weren't in their interests at all, but only in for the interests of others. So they, they chased me up, they followed me up, they asked me if, I, if they could help me with things when it, it really didn't help them, it didn't suit them, it, they kind of went out of their way. And uh, I remember thinking, as I used to think as an atheist, I can remember very clearly, why would I do something that wasn't in my interest? Like if it didn't benefit me, it was kind of not a question of, or, you know, something I would consider. And these people had a very different mindset. Mm. So you were, when you went to university, you would have considered yourself an atheist? Yes. Yeah. So was there a reason for that? Like, what was, what were your, what was your rationale? Well, I guess uh, if there was a God, he was kind of like a vending machine. You know, if there was a God, his job was to serve us, not, not us to serve him. I could kind of treat him like a credit card. Uh, yeah, I hadn't really heard any different, and I just kind of assumed that was the case. Mm -hmm. But then you met these Christians these pesky Christians yeah. at university and yeah. had you met Christians before that? Uh, not really, no. I'd, I'd met a few nominal Catholics, uh, but that was about it. Mm -hmm. So then you met these Christians at university and, and then what happened? Yeah, and so I kept coming along and uh, they invited me to their mid-year camp, which they called Summit. And uh, on the camp there was talks on the book of Leviticus, of all things, which persuaded me uh, if there is a God, that you've got to come to him on his terms, not your own. I can't just decide what God is like and kind of, okay, now you can be my credit card or vending machine or whatever, but you've got to come to God on his terms. And so I did. Wow. And so what happened after that? You... Yep. So then I... Uh, you weren't an atheist any longer, I assume? No, no. So I became a Christian on the 11th of July, 2001, and uh, kept coming along to the Christian Union, got involved in the church. Uh, those kind of things. I uh, read the, the Bible, uh, had lots and lots of questions, and so uh, asked questions, got answers, read lots of, of books as well. Well, one of the key questions is obviously the one that we're discussing today, the problem of evil. Now, usually there's two reasons that people reflect on the problem of evil, or the problem of pain and suffering. One's out of philosophical curiosity, and the other is often born out of painful real-life experience. Uh, why is the problem of evil a particular issue for you? 
Mm, for me, it was much more uh, intellectual curiosity. Uh, I mentioned I had lots of questions, and I got lots of answers, or po were pointed to books where there was lots of answers. But there was one question I could never really get an answer for, and that was the problem of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Mm. What, do you want to explain that problem? What, what, is, what is that? What's yeah. the problem there? So if God is sovereign over absolutely everything... What do you mean by sovereign? In like, control. In control, right. If God yeah. runs the whole show, he's in control of absolutely everything, then how can people be responsible for their actions? Mm basically. It's a problem. It's a big problem, yeah. And uh, I, everyone, basically, that I asked kind of ended up in mystery. And people pointed me to books, and they ended up in mystery, and they said there's no solutions. And uh, having studied mathematics, I, I just could never leave it as a mystery. For me, problems were to be solved. I could not think about it. Mm -hmm. So I, I just kept pressing and pressing and thinking about it. I thought about it for about nine years. and it's then It's a lot of thinking. Yeah. And then I finally came to a solution that, for me, uh, explained all of the parts of the Bible that talk about God's sovereignty and human responsibility and didn't explain any of them away. And I wrote that up as a fourth year project uh, last year at Moore College. And uh, people have read that and have suggested it's kind of a theodicy. It, it really explains uh, how God can bring out good through the evil that we perpetrate. So in many respects, your thinking there has helped you think through the problem of pain, suffering and evil as well. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to talk about the problem of evil now, but just before we talk about that, as I said, we're conscious that people who are listening here now uh, might be experiencing pain or difficulty or suffering themselves. What would you say to the person listening right now who's experiencing difficulty? I guess don't waste your sorrows, or to put it positively, invest your tears. Uh, they're, they're the titles of two books that have come out kind of recently on this subject. Uh, suffering can either crush you or it can make you great, depending on how you approach it. There's a kind of a spectrum of ways of approaching it. Quite often, uh, people fall into a kind of a moralist way of approaching it, like Job's friends. Uh, it's, you know, you've done this wrong thing, it's your fault, you've got to repent, it's that kind of thing. Or they can go on the other side of the spectrum. Instead of having the moral approach of Job's friends, they have the cynical approach of Job's wife, where they say, curse God and die. You know, this shows there's no God, or if there's a God, I don't want anything to do with him, that kind of thing. Uh, but those, I think, are really both pat answers that... They're really ways for you to try and control a situation that is out of your control. I think a much better approach is the Bible's approach, which really invites you to cry out to God in the suffering. If you read through the Psalms, the Psalmists are always crying out to God in the suffering. Christianity really gives you permission to cry out to God, to hold on to him. And by doing so, the suffering can make you great. You can come out of it much stronger, much deeper person. So suffering shouldn't tear you away from your relationship with God. If anything, I think it should draw you closer to it. So don't approach suffering like Job's friends or Job's wife. Approach it like Job. Mm. Okay, well, we'll get to that in a second, but let's just outline the problem of evil in its sort of classical form. Uh, and it's considered by many as the greatest obstacle to belief in God. Mm. So many have stopped believing in God or have never started believing in God because of the presence of suffering in the world. Now, I'll just state the philosophical problem just so that we're all clear about that, and then we'll get your reactions and thoughts and intrigued to hear how you feel like you've solved it, which will be quite interesting. Sure. So first it's claimed that God is all-powerful. Then it's also claimed that God is all-loving. Yet evil exists in this world created by this God. Now if God is all-powerful, then he could eliminate evil. But if God is all-loving, then he would eliminate all evil. However, since evil exists in the world, it means that God is either not all-powerful or not all-loving. God must be impotent or wicked. Now, it sounds very convincing. It's persuaded lots of very intelligent people, but you're not convinced. What, what, are, your, what are your reactions? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think uh, the first part of the problem posed, now if God is all-powerful, then he could eliminate evil. That's very true. If God can't eliminate evil, then he's not powerful. Mm. But the second part, if God is all-loving, then he would eliminate evil. I think that really carries an assumption that if I can't think of a good reason that God would allow evil and suffering, then there can't be a reason that God would allow evil and suffering. Mm. You're, you're essentially demanding that an omniscient God who knows everything can't know something that you don't know, which it seems fairly false to me, or I don't know why you would make that assumption. It's almost like they want a God who's big enough to blame, but a God who's not big enough to have a plan. Right. I would suggest, indeed, you can't have it both ways. So your suggestion is that that second point, that uh, he would eliminate all evil, may not necessarily be true. Yeah, exactly. Um, suggesting that because we don't know the reason doesn't mean there can't be a reason. Uh, I'm not kind of trying to 
give you the reason in order to disprove the argument. I'm just trying to show that the argument doesn't really stand up unless God is not big enough to have a plan. Right, okay. So tell us, what's God's plan? Yeah, so I hope I'm more drawing out the Bible's solution than my own. But I think when the Bible looks at the problem of evil and suffering, it, it points us to three points in history. The begin, beginning of history, uh, the centerpiece of history, and then the end of history. So in the beginning of history, why is there evil and suffering? It's essentially because we chose it. We've turned our back on the source of life and the source of all goodness, and that has real consequences. We have a world with thorns and thistles and pain and suffering. But the Bible also turns our attention to what it considers to be the centerpiece of history, which is Jesus' death and resurrection. And there we see that uh, why is there evil and suffering? Well, it can't be because God doesn't love us, because God demonstrates his love in this, that Jesus died while we were still sinners. And then finally, the Bible points us to what it sees as the end of history, where there will be no more crying or mourning or suffering or pain. And we see that God's plan is to end all of evil and suffering without ending us. And that can give us real meaning and purpose and hope here today. And, and meaning and purpose that suffering can't take away. So do you want to give us some examples from perhaps from the scriptures or from your own thinking about how this actually plays out? One of the things that was key for me in my thinking, uh, Genesis chapter 50, 20, after Joseph has been sold by his brothers into slavery, he says to his brothers, you intended for harm, but God intended for good, the saving of many lives. So uh, God is sovereign over the world in such a way that it's, he's not sovereign instead of us, but he's sovereign through us. Uh, so even through the evil actions of Joseph's brothers, uh, God can bring about good. So mm. he, do, he does good quite a lot and he allows evil, but ultimately for the greater good. We mentioned the book of Job. Like it has obviously, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the book of Job. It's an Old Testament book which explores the problem of pain and suffering in many ways. How does Job help think through this issue. You mentioned that you prefer to be Job rather than his friends or his wife. Why is that? So I think uh, in Job we see that God doesn't cause evil or suffering directly, but he allows it to happen, and often for purposes that we can't see at the time. Uh, so in Job's case, I think it's so that the proven genuineness of his faith may result in praise, glory, and honor when God is revealed. Uh, in Joseph's case, it's for the saving of many lives. In Jesus' case, it's for the salvation of the world. Uh, and you see that in Acts 2.23, where uh, Peter says that God handed this man Jesus over to be crucified by his plan and foreknowledge, but you, by the help of wicked men, put him to death. Well, you mentioned Jesus just now, so why don't we have a bit of a think about uh, some of what Jesus has to say on this problem. So let's look at Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. That's a parable of the weeds, which is the logos of the day. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters first, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. So what do we make of this parable? How does, how does this help us with the problem of suffering? Yeah, uh, I think firstly, it, it shows what you see at the start of Job, that God stands behind good and evil asymmetrically. What do you mean by that? So not, not in the same way. Right. He causes good and he allows evil, bringing out the greater good. Uh, but I think also when you read Jesus' explanation of the parable back into the parable, you, you really see how it's a parable about the angels asking God about the problem of evil and suffering. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we should. I've got that written down here as well. Maybe we should listen to that explanation. I'll read it out now. So Jesus does explain the parable a little bit later in Matthew, Matthew 13, 36. And he says, Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The son of man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into a blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So how does that help further explain 
what you were talking about. Yeah, so if you read that explanation back into the parable, then in verse 28, when the servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? They're, the angels are saying, God, can we end the evil? Let's end evil and pain and suffering right now. Yeah. And God says, no, because you'll pull up the wheat. Don't end evil and suffering because that'll end all of those who are caught up with it, if you like. So if I uh, had a crowded room of people and I asked them... Uh, like, the, like the crowded room of sure. people we have here in front of us now. Yeah. That's right. So can I get you to put your hands up if you've ever caused someone pain or suffering or harm? So then the problem becomes... Every, every hand every hand raised. raised up. Yeah. Do you then want God to end all evil, pain and suffering without ending everyone with their hands up? Because that is exactly what... This the, is what you're saying that the, the question is asking. The question becomes, yeah. And I think uh, Jesus' death and resurrection for us enables God to do exactly that, to end all the evil and suffering without ending us who are caught up with it. Mm. So you're saying then this is where the, the third point, the end of history becomes crucial. That exactly. Evil is some ways tolerated now until we get to that final end point in history where everything is going to be Yeah, and I righted. think you see that in Romans 8 where Paul says, I consider the present suffering is not comparable to the glory we will have in heaven. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So is, he, is this God just trying to make the best of a bad situation? Like he's being caught out and now he's going to, okay, okay well, we'll, just, well, we'll just wait till the end and get it all sorted out then. How can he be truly sovereign or in control at this point? Yeah, and it kind of raises the bigger question also, what could possibly be worth all the pain and suffering? Why did God do it this way mm. as opposed to another way where we don't have it? And I think there's really three uh, answers or approaches to that question so that the ultimate good could be possible so that the ultimate good could be imparted and so that the ultimate good could be a reality okay do you want to just unpack those because uh, i'm not quite sure anyone got those <laughs> sure so first of all so that the ultimate good could be possible you can't have genuine love unless you have genuine choice uh, if, if we were all created robots if there was no way that we could rebel against god then we couldn't genuinely love god job's accusation would stand does job fear god for nothing he loves you for what you've given him we would just be kind of, you know, people who married God for his money as opposed to loving God for who he is. You need freedom to have genuine love. We have that freedom and we chose uh, to rebel. But secondly, so that the ultimate good could be imparted. And uh, John Newton uh, is brilliant on this. The, the man who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, he also wrote many other hymns, one of which is called Prayer Answered by Crosses. And that's uh, meant something quite dear to me, especially this year. I'll just read it to you now. I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love in every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. T'was he who taught me thus to pray, and he, I trust, has answered prayer, but it has been in such a way as almost drove me to despair. I hoped that in some favoured hour at once he'd answer my request, and by his love's constraining power subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more with his own hand he seemed, intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gods and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling cried. Will thou pursue thy worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou may find thy all in me. So God ultimately, I think, allows the evil and suffering that we experience to grow us up so that we don't stay shallow and superficial. If you, if you meet people in life that haven't experienced any suffering, they're quite often very shallow and superficial. They're not, suffering kind of deepens us in a way that's, mm. you know, that, mm. that's kind of the soul-making argument. Finally, uh, it's so that the ultimate good could be a reality, so that we could have heaven, if you like. Uh, to, to express the problem and the solution as concisely as possible, if God is so good, why didn't he create the best possible world? I think the answer is the best possible world is heaven, but you have to go through earth to get there. Heaven wouldn't be heaven without earth. It'd be the garden without the tree. Heaven will be so glorious that we will see the reason for the Mm. suffering on earth. Now, a question has come through. What role then does prayer play? Because many Christians are speaking to God, calling out to him. Sometimes prayers are not answered the way that we would like, and we see loved ones suffer and or ourselves suffer, and prayer does not seem to be answered. How do we fit that into this schema that you've proposed or that you suggested the Bible is saying? Yeah, great question. Uh, I think uh, John Newton's prayer answered by crosses uh, helps us here a lot, I think. So uh, God doesn't always answer our prayers the way we want him to, uh, but that doesn't mean that he's not listening or he's not answering our prayers. I think ultimately God... Uh, answers our prayers in the way that we would have asked if we had known everything that God knows. 
uh, quite often uh, we want things that aren't good for us. Sometimes we pray for snakes or for stones, but God gives us good things. He gives us bread, he gives us water. So you mean snakes and stones, like figuratively in the sense that we pray for things that aren't actually good for us? Yes. So I was alluding to uh, something Jesus says, uh, who of you, though you know how to give good gifts to your children, if they ask for you know, bread, will give them a snake. If they ask for water, will give them a stone. Sometimes we pray for things that will be harmful to us. Um, sometimes. I suppose you're a, you're a, a parent, you're a father. Mm. So I imagine that there's a couple of times when your, your children have asked for things that you've not given them because it's for their good. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm, sometimes... I'm I remember, I know my, my daughter once asked for chocolate at 7 p.m. one night, and I sort of thought, actually, no, that's not good for you. I'll say, no, there were tears, but... Uh, but it was for her ultimate good. I How think. long, oh, Dad, until you give me this chocolate? <laughs> yeah, a, yeah. Is that what you get from your, your children? They ask you... How long, oh, Dad? Yeah, definitely. You get, you get all those kind of complaints. Uh, I think another thing, you also let your children learn things the hard way for their good. And sometimes God allows us to learn things the hard way. It's, you know, for the good of those who love him. Yeah. Well, we've talked about often the human causation of evil. So and everyone in the room has condemned themselves by putting their hands up to say that they've caused someone to pain and suffer. Now, we're not going to get a confession from everybody out trying to tell us exactly those moments and when that actually happened. But what about natural evil? Things like cancer, disease, how do we account for that? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure I can give you one blanket answer and say this is why all, all the time why God does this. Uh, there's a couple of reasons in the Bible that suggest some of the reasons why God might be allowing these things to happen. Uh, so, I mean, first of all, it could just be because we've turned our back on the source of all goodness. Uh, sin has consequences. I wouldn't only want to say that to anyone, though, because it's essentially the reply of Job's friends. I think it can... Say that again. So that, that's the, what's the reply of Job's friends? That uh, We did it. We're responsible. We're it's responsible. our fault. It's your fault. It's kind of the religious answer, but it's not, I don't think, the Bible's answer or the gospel answer, really. Mm. So you've got cancer because you've done something wrong? Yeah, I would never say that to anyone. No, but that's not what the Bible's saying either. Exactly. Yep. But I think another reason why God might be allowing evil and suffering is it's quite often his megaphone to the world calling people back to him. So in Luke 13, when uh, a tower falls on some people but not others, Jesus says, do you think it fell on them because there were worse sinners? No, I tell you, but unless you two repent, you, like you need to repent in order to be saved. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, writes a bit on this, actually. In The Problem of Pain, he writes, We can ignore pleasure, but pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And uh, Tim Keller put on Facebook just yesterday a very similar sentiment. Suffering awakens us out of our haunted sleep of spiritual self-sufficiency into a serious search for the divine. It's uh, quite often the way that God gets us to call out to him. Uh, quite often it's also to display the work of God in people's lives. So in John chapter 9, uh, some disciples go up to Jesus and say, who sinned that he was born blind? Was it him or his parents? Jesus says, neither. It was so that the work of God can be displayed in his life. This is actually empirically verifiable. So uh, there was a woman called Christine Tin Johannesson Henry uh, who did a PhD that she released last year from the University of Copenhagen, where she looked at a lot of people who were suffering and the correlation that faith made or lack of faith made to the suffering. And in her PhD, she says this, my results show that people's individual Christian faith becomes present during times of personal crisis. Faith and hope manifest themselves very intensely, but it is rare that they show in the classical forms we normally associate with Christianity. Rather than a single set of static beliefs, everyday Christianity constantly unfolds in multiple ways in relation to others. The results of the study show that the deeper the crisis people find themselves in, the higher the level of faith and belief in God, while they also experience a greater will to live and a more vibrant sense of being. So what she's saying is that rather than being a, the suffering being a, a problem, it's actually an advantage. Well, faith is certainly an advantage in the suffering. Uh, if, if you suffer as an atheism, then there's no point calling out for the simple reason there's no one to call out to. Mm -hmm. But uh, everyone experiences suffering and uh, faith really helps. Pe it, it really does genuinely help people to get through it and come out stronger. It, suffering can make you great as opposed to crushing you. Another question just come through, which is a very good question. A weed cannot change into wheat. So can an evil person excuse their actions as that's how they're made? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, I think at this point we may be pushing the parable beyond what it's uh, intended to say. Uh, God can turn weeds into wheat. And I think by sending Jesus to die on our behalf, the, the fire that the weed deserves is taken by Jesus on the cross. And, and so we are 
we are pardoned. We have the free we are treated as wheat. I suppose your own story is one of weeds to wheat as well. Yeah, I was smoking a lot of weed and, <laughs> and now I'm not. Well, open up now. If we've got a couple more minutes for some perhaps questions from the floor. Yes. Wouldn't we agree that, that uh, the God who allows suffering has experienced it himself in the incarnation, mm. in the coming of our, our Lord and in his death on the cross? So uh, far from being an insoluble problem is a God who's come and experienced the, the height of suffering in his own self. Indeed, that's a very good point. Uh, I read a book that was written by a man who had lost three children at various ages. Mm-hmm. And uh, some pastors came in and they you know, t- read all the right verses, Psalm 23, Romans 8, those kind of things. And, and the guy, he just, he, he just wanted them to leave. He didn't want to hear it, that kind of thing. There was another pastor who came in and he just sat with him and prayed. And uh, the man writes, you know, I hated to see him leave. So if God had have just kind of given us, come down and given us a philosophical solution to the problem of evil, that's nothing like actually experiencing it with us and, and you know, giving us the practical thing that we need when we actually experience suffering. So God coming down and experiencing the ultimate suffering on our behalf so that we don't have to is, is very powerful and much more powerful than any philosophical answer could possibly be. So John, today we've thought about suffering. So in your view, myth or truth, can can God really be there amidst the pain? Yes, I think very much so. In fact, uh, for C.S. Lewis, the, the fact that we know that pain is bad was a clue for God. If, if there was no God, then it would just be kind of random and uh, there'd be nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, that kind of thing. But the fact that we do want to cry out to someone indicates that there might be someone to cry out to. Hmm. So given this, how should we respond? If you're listening here today and you think, okay, well, Maybe this doesn't preclude the existence of God. What's next? What's the next step? Mm. Uh, don't waste your sorrows. Invest your tears. You know, uh, don't let suffering crush you. Let it make you into something great. Don't let it uh, draw you away from God, but cry out to him in, in the pain. You don't learn how to pray in the good times. You only learn how to pray in the bad times. So suffering, while it's incredibly difficult and hard at the time, uh, it, if you hold on to God, it can make you something so much greater. Thanks so much, John. It's been a pleasure to have you here today. I'll leave you with the Logos for the day. Matthew 13, 41. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. Whoever has ears, let him hear. I look forward to you joining us next time for Logos Live. And please thank our guests today, John Hudson. 